Okay, what if today we looked at Animal Crossing details that you probably definitely missed from across the Animal Crossing franchise? Like for instance, in Animal Crossing New Leaf for the 3DS, we finally saw the big return of the train station for the first time since the original Animal Crossing games on the N64 and GameCube. I mean, that's cool and all, but there's actually some interesting dialogue that one of your villagers might randomly bring up, asking if you noticed that the train that you see traveling from town to town is a fourth generation train. I mean, it's interesting already that there's lore about the trains of the Animal Crossing universe, especially beyond the Maglev Mike storytelling that we hear about in Animal Crossing New Horizons, but this reference to the train being a fourth generation train is actually a larger reference to Animal Crossing as a whole, as well, obviously Animal Crossing New Leaf is the fourth main series game in the Animal Crossing franchise, so this is just like a clever little nod. Okay, if you've played any of the older Animal Crossing games, you know that Joan is your go-to person when it comes to playing the Turnip Market game, which acts very similarly to the Animal Crossing version of the real-world stock exchange. However, we have to give credit to the localization team at Nintendo because coming up with the name for Joan was really clever, and it's something that they continued to play on for years later. Obviously, we have the Sao Joan stock market, which is a clever play on the real world Dow Jones industrial average, which is a stock market index of the 30 prominent companies listed on stock exchanges in the US. But then in Animal Crossing New Horizons, they introduced Sao Jones successor in the form of Daisy May. And since Nintendo leaned into market puns with the original character, Daisy May may very well be named after Fannie Mae, which here in the US is a government sponsored financial mortgage association. It's maybe not as closely tied to the stock market as the original Joan or Sao Joan stock market was a play on the real world stock exchange, but keeping the parody of a financial institute is still really clever. Now in the past we've talked about how the character Kix is typed up in the way of having almost this British Cockney accent, but let's take it a step further and actually look into this character based on the way that he dresses. The fact that in some of the games he cleans shoes or is like a shoe shiner. Over the years some fans have suggested suggested that maybe this character is inspired by Oliver Twist who this character not only dresses similarly and speaks similarly to that of Kix, but some people can't help but to wonder if maybe this character is supposed to be a larger parody with a first name or something that we've never actually seen before. Maybe his name's Oliver Kix and it's a play on Oliver Twist. I don't know. I totally think that that's what they're doing here, but maybe it's just one of those out there theories. All right, then over in Animal Crossing New Leaf, there is something really interesting. Wherever your recycle shop is in your main town, no matter what your layout is or however your town is set up, there will always be a small pond either on the left or the right side of the retail shop. Hey, if you don't believe me, go ahead and log onto your New Leaf town and take a look for yourself. You'll see that there's a little pond on one of the two sides of it close by. Also with the introduction of Animal Crossing New Leaf, besides the regular pitfall seeds, which can be used to knock villagers into holes in the ground or sometimes trick other players into falling into holes in the ground, New Leaf added the introduction of the tricky pitfall seed, a new and rarer variation of the regular pitfall. These ones are a bit rarer as you most of the time can only find them available inside of the police station in New Leaf and that's only after you've managed to unlock the police station itself. If you find it in the Lost and Found though, you're allowed to take it along with you and when you bury it, interestingly enough, the little star on the ground that indicates something is buried is substantially smaller, making it much harder to see and easier to trick either other players or, you know, push a villager into it. Oh, and I just know people will be coming to use it on me at some point. Fortunately enough for me and oddly enough for the Animal Crossing franchise, this this tricky pitfall seed would never make a return in the future follow-up game New Horizons and still hasn't made a return in any capacity in anything really either. So one thing that Nintendo does really well with the Animal Crossing games is with all of these Animal Crossing characters that exist in the game series, there has been an effort to try to make each and every villager somewhat different from one another, even though Animal Crossing only has eight different personality types by the newer games. So with just eight personality types and those eight personality types all being gender locked. Another element added into the Animal Crossing games to make these types of characters stand out are hobbies. Every single villager besides whatever personality type they have will also have a unique hobby that makes it where even if you have two villagers with the same personality types they'll still have different 
hobbies. With all that being said though, the villager Sasha is actually the only male character in the entire Animal Crossing series to have the fashion hobby. The Animal Crossing anime that released in 2006 in Japan has always been something really interesting to me, and maybe at some point in the future we need to do a dedicated video where we just dive into that thing, because it seems like there's so much interesting stuff that has come out of this alone. Like for instance, the main character Ai is actually voiced by the famous voice actress Yui Hori. She has a long list of roles, but she's known for playing characters like Carla in Fairy Tale or Chie in Persona 4. More recently, she was La Brava in My Hero Academia, and she even voiced Furuzen in Genshin Impact. Tom Nook's character is voiced by Naoki Tatsuta, who played Oolong in Dragon Ball, Zenji in Hunter x Hunter, Cole in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and even showed up in the Tamagotchi movie playing the character Mr. Turtle Dictionary. Okay, just a couple other quick interesting ones also from the cast. Rosie was voiced by Musato Fukuen. She played as Ash's Oshawa in the Black and White series of the Pokemon show, but in the Japanese version, obviously. She played Himiko Toga in My Hero Academia, and she also voiced Sakura in the Street Fighter games. In Animal Crossing New Leaf, there's some interesting things in Club LOL, that dance club area that you can unlock after playing the game for a while. Like, for instance, the music that plays while you're in the club is actually a remix of the marquee theme from Animal Crossing City Folk, a location that you could only access through the city part of the game that was never brought back. Now, this is clever because Dr. Shrunk would perform at the marquee, so to bring that song back in the form of the club that he owns is kind of a cool callback to City Folk. Here's a clip of what the song sounded like in City Folk, followed by the remixed version found in Club LOL. Also, you might have noticed that this yellow welcome sign to the left of the door here is misspelled. It says welcome without the E. I totally didn't notice this until just recently, but the Club LOL logo actually has the outline of Dr. Strong's head in the design itself. I don't know how I went this long without actually noticing that, but because now I've noticed, I needed to at least bring it up in a video somehow. Does anyone remember the game Wii Music that came out on, well, the Wii? It was an interesting game where you would play music using the Wii controls and it would a lot of the time being Nintendo based music and fortunately enough Animal Crossing did get its own reputation in the game by having two different songs you could play. Now when you look up these types of moments on YouTube a lot of the times they sound a little bit uh, scuffed maybe. Listen to this. I mean, it was Wii music. It was a weird time to be alive, but it was still as cool just to see Animal Crossing getting some praise and recognition here. Fortunately enough, there are some versions of this on YouTube that at least sound better. Okay, you know what's weird? Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. This game was not very good. It was kind of panned across the board, but you gotta give credit where credit is due. There is a YouTube channel called Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival Daily, and these guys are playing through the game every single day through all of the year 2023. It is November and they are still going daily. Now, I'm not 100% sure how this works. I wanna say they maybe recorded it mostly in one sitting and then spliced it up so that there was a day represented for each day of the year and the turn that rolls is on the corresponding day of the upload which must have taken a lot of planning but it is funny that every day there's like a one to two minute long upload of the worst Animal Crossing game. I do have to say I am very surprised there's only 192 subscribers considering how great of a meme this is so make sure you guys go and get your fill on your daily amiibo festival needs, I guess. Way back in the earliest days of Animal Crossing, the Nintendo Japanese website or magazine ran a public poll as to which Animal Crossing character was the community's all-time favorite. Now, there's a couple of interesting answers that came from this poll. Firstly, for non-villagers but special characters, KK Slider and Mr. Rossetti overwhelmingly won the contest. But then, when it came to other characters or regular characters, surprisingly enough, Peanut of all villagers took that number one regular villager spot. Then fourth overall or second when it comes to villagers only was Bunny. Fifth went to Rover the cat at the beginning of the game on the train. Sixth, seventh, and eighth went to Bob, Mitzi, and Rosie respectively, all popular cat villagers. Nine went to the penguin Aurora, and tenth, finally, Tom Nook. 
Here he is. I guess in the earlier games, he was more of an antagonist type character. Or at least some people deemed him as an antagonist because, you know, we owe him so much money. Come on, he was a nice guy. One of my personal favorite villagers, though, Kiki, was number 11 on that poll. So there we are. Nowadays, there's unofficial polls ran from time to time, and it seems like the top most popular villagers usually end up being Raymond, Shino, or Judy, with non-villager characters being Isabel and Tom Nook, KK Slider probably too. So it is interesting how some things have substantially changed over time. Okay, you ever notice these yellow birds that stand on the bulletin board over here? Or maybe at night, if you play in the evening, you'll notice these owls. They might actually have a little more to do than just a cool aesthetic or vibe that exists in Animal Crossing. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think they also have to do with the aesthetic and vibe, but they might actually serve a greater purpose. I can't believe I haven't been able to test this out even more thoroughly, but apparently they might be placed there as an indicator that you have a new bulletin board message, which makes total sense. I just never put two and two together until now when I was researching for this video. This apparently has been a thing since the New Leaf days, so if someone wants to check it for me and confirm, that would be really cool. Okay, not to talk about Club LOL for the entirety of this video, but there is one more interesting thing about this. Club LOL in Japan is actually localized different over there as Club 444 instead of LOL. Now what's interesting is in Japan, four is already like an unlucky number, but the four in Club 444 actually plays an even deeper and funny double reference here. In Japan, one of the pronunciations for four is she, and in Japan, Dr. Shrunk's name is Shisho, so it is a clever pun there. However, some alternate readings of this with the way that it's spelled out in Japanese could also insinuate that the club could be considered Club Death Death Death, which is a really awesome name for a band if you specialize in metal music, so I mean, it's a great name either way. Okay, now look at this. Remember the villager Bangle? She's like a peppy tiger villager that you can get. Out of all of the tigers in Animal Crossing, she is the only tiger villager not to appear in Animal Crossing Pocket Camp for some reason. Yeah, we still don't know why she's not over there. She's been around in most of the games, being in the original Animal Crossing game. She was sunsetted for a little while, then came back in New Leaf, but still hasn't shown up for Pocket Camp despite appearing in New Horizons. Now, for a long time, I was always puzzled why the character Rover was a cat, or why a cat character that talks to you on a train at the beginning of the game was called Rover. And for the longest time, I had no idea, but now I think I finally might have cracked the code, and it's probably just a very simple play on words that is still really clever. I think the character Rover is representative of the idea of starting over, or starting your life over, and he has this character name that kind of is a play into that theme, which is very present, especially in the first Animal Crossing game. Alternatively, the only other time in the first Animal Crossing game that you see this character is if you're traveling to another person's town, as in you're going over, or someone else is coming over to your town. So the train being this mechanism of either starting over or going over to someone else's area might have been one of the reasoning that they chose to have the name that he has, at least in the English localizations of the game. I mean, his original Japanese name just translates to strange cat. So this very well could just be a clever little thing that was put in in the translation to appeal to English audiences, which we know had a huge localization effort when this game did come to the West. Digging a little deeper, some fans Fans have theorized that his name could come from the verb roving, which means to travel without a set destination, which also could very well be the case with this character name, but I still think that my theory of coming over and starting over also could apply here as well. Okay, way back in Animal Crossing E+, which only released in Japan, there were these little dolls that you could have in your house called Daruma dolls. These are actually real types of traditional Japanese dolls, which are modeled after Bohidharma, the founder of the Zen tradition of Buddhism. These things never made an appearance again in an Animal Crossing game, likely because the localization efforts were kind of combined in later Animal Crossing games after the Japan exclusive E+. But finally, when the whole Happy Home Paradise update rolled out into Animal Crossing New Horizons, these items were brought back for the first time in almost two decades, they were renamed to Dharma Dolls, and it's really interesting to see something that existed in one of the older Animal Crossing games that was kind of obscure and forgotten about to be brought back all these years later. Also, this is just an interesting thing when it comes to dates, but the date that they announced 
the 2.0 update that Animal Crossing Direct back in 2021 actually fell on Brewster's birthday. And as you remember, one of the biggest, most exciting things was the fact that Brewster was coming back with the 2.0 update. All the way back in the first Animal Crossing release for the Nintendo 64, Dobutsu no Mori Animal Forest in Japan only, there were two paintings that were in that game that ended up getting removed from the GameCube release of Animal Forest in Japan. And they were the dreadful painting and the novel painting. Now these two paintings were the screen by Edvard Munch and composition with red, yellow, and blue by Pierre Mondrian, which at the time were still legally owned by the artist's estates, with the museum that housed the screen being particularly aggressive with enforcing their ownership. So due to this copyright issue, these paintings were removed from the later releases of the game, though they still, interestingly enough, exist in the code for Animal Forest Plus, the first GameCube Japan version of the game. Though later versions of the game, like the American Animal Crossing game or the Japanese Animal Forest E Plus version of the game, did not have the string of code for the painting still found in the files. Though, there was an obscure service you could use in Japan only if you were an N64 player that would let you transfer your save data from the N64 to the GameCube for the original Animal Forest Plus GameCube version. It was like a whole call-in service, you had to send your game over to them, it was a big ordeal. But in that version, if you had a painting in the N64 version, you would be able to have your painting still in the GameCube version of the game, as long as it was just that first version of the GameCube game. I know that's confusing, but it's really interesting to see how they approached avoiding this potential copyright issue. Okay, some of you might remember this, but back in 2020, there was a massive giga leak that happened, resulting in a ton of information from Nintendo and Nintendo projects surfacing for the public to learn about. What's interesting though, is that during this giga leak, we learned quite a bit about some things that might've been different in the early days of Animal Crossing. For instance, in some of the early builds for the very first Animal Forest game, cherries apparently were originally going to be chestnuts and nuts wouldn't even appear as a fruit until the introduction of lychees in Animal Crossing New Leaf. There were plans to have medicine appear in the first Animal Forest game for the N64. However, this ended up getting cut, though it would eventually be added later on in Animal Crossing E+, which only was available in Japan. K.K. Slider actually has a little bit of an interesting variation in some of the earlier development phases of the game. Found in some of the files, there are suggestions that K.K. Slider would have had his air checks given out on mini discs instead. You know, like these were the things in like the early 2000s that kind of were around for a little while. Now, it seems like this was likely changed because of the fact that all of the music players in the game kind of vary across the board. Like some of the music playing items are like cassette players, some are CD players or stereos. So instead of having like one select music playback format, instead they opted just to do a musical note that could work on any of the music players that were featured in the game. Also, perhaps in the earliest days of Animal Crossing's development, when they were first programming the game out, whenever you would catch a fish or an insect, there would just be like a generic icon that would show up, where in the final release of the game, there would be a different sprite depending on which fish or insect you actually caught. Animal Crossing City Folk is kind of an interesting game. It was the first game to introduce a bus that would take you to the city. And with the introduction of this bus, there are a couple of really interesting details that a lot of players have likely definitely missed. Like for instance, when the bus arrives, the engine is running, but after the player leaves the platform, gets seated in the bus, and then the bus is about to leave, we hear Cap'n start the engine up again, which is kind of funny because the engine was never turned off in the first place. Also, interestingly enough, apparently in Animal Crossing City Folk, if you have a snowball or like a ball of snow that's built up as if you're going to make a snow person and you put it up in front of where your bus stop is and then call the bus in, your bus ride will actually get canceled as a message will come up saying that the bus has been canceled due to roads being blocked with snow. And then of course, there's a couple other really small details you may have missed in Animal Crossing City Folk like posters or advertisements inside the bus itself. You can't read them ever that clearly when you're playing in the game, but if you look here, you can see this is an advert for the Happy Room Academy. We don't really know what it says on there, but that does look like Lyle, I'm pretty sure. And somehow this poster is supposed to be an ad for Katrina's fortune-telling shop. Um, yeah, I 
guess so. Maybe. Okay, so people who really like trains probably will understand what this means and the significance of this better than I will. But in Animal Crossing New Leaf, the train that goes by has a specific whistle sound effect, which apparently is a significant thing. Like, I guess certain train enthusiasts can identify a train based on its whistle. And it just so happens that the train in Animal Crossing New Leaf matches the train of that Canadian National 3254's out of tune whistle. So that's pretty neat. Okay, this one, some of you who are like hardcore Animal Crossing players might know, but a lot of casual players probably never noticed, myself included until more recently. But in Animal Crossing New Leaf, if you got a perfect town, you would gain the ability to upgrade the exterior of your town hall, which actually is really cool. You could change it to a Zen castle tower type hall, a fairy tale looking town hall, or a more modern town hall. Here's another little interesting thing. In every Animal Crossing game, when the game time strikes midnight, the next day doesn't officially start in the game. Sure, the calendar day will move over, but the town or the island won't reset to be prepped for the next day. In most Animal Crossing games, the day reset where it kind of marks the beginning of a new day where the island or town will be fully flushed out and restarted is usually at 6 a.m. However, Animal Crossing New Horizons was the first game to change this, making the wake up time 5 a.m. instead. So if you're playing at 4.59 and 5 o'clock rolls around, you will see a little fade to black and boom, you're on the next day of Animal Crossing New Horizons. Okay, so what did you guys think about this video? Let us know in the comments down below. Make sure you are subscribed and notifications on, especially if you're watching this on a television set. Just, just trust me, it's worth getting the remote and subscribing for a second. It helps me out a lot. Otherwise, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time with a brand new video.